Welcome to the Emolition Derby podcast. I'm your host, Alessandro, and I'm a huge music nerd. I've been playing in bands for well over a decade, but have since gone on to become a music journalist working for several notable outlets, including Alternative Press. As a journalist, I cover a wide range of stories within music, culture, fashion, and just about everything else. However, I would say that first and foremost, I'm an alternative and emo historian and want to use this podcast as a means to connect with artists, musicians, and creatives to get the answers that I've always wanted and have an open forum to discuss fascinating stories within our special underground community. We release one episode per week that will either be long-form interviews with myself and a host of brilliant artists and figures from prominent acts across a wide range of genres, as well as other episodes where I sit down with my closest friends and co-producers, Joe Giordano and Ethan Fuller, to have what we call roundtable discussions. For those episodes, expect nerdy deep dives on music, as well as our fair share of hot takes and fiery debates. Whether we are sitting down with your favorite artists or just having fun between the three of us, Emolition Derby is a must-listen podcast for all things alternative, emo, and beyond. For today's episode, I sit down with my new friend, Zach Eisenstein. Many will know that Zach was the co-vocalist and guitarist of the influential pop-punk group Man Overboard. Much like my conversation with Joe B. from Transit, who were some of the band's biggest contemporaries in the 2010 pop-punk and emo revival, Man Overboard rose to prominence during a time where emo and pop-punk largely returned to its roots in the VFW hall circuit and a return to the more raw sound of the genre that was the perfect antithesis to the glossy pop radio sound of the neon era that mostly made up the late 2000s. Zach released several groundbreaking releases with Man Overboard on labels ranging from Run For Cover Records to Rise Records. It didn't take long after the success of the band's debut album, Real Talk, following that, the self-titled record, and then especially their third record, Heart Attack, for the band to quickly become a main stage act and a force to be reckoned with within the scene. We also cannot forget about the band's strong marketing with their now classic line of merch and t-shirts that adorned the slogan, Defend Pop Punk, that soon became a staple throughout the early to mid-2010s. Man Overboard did abruptly go on hiatus in 2016, following the release of their divisive yet criminally underrated record, Heavy Love. And for many fans, myself included, we never knew exactly what happened and what the dynamic was like within the band during this time for them to go on hiatus like that, when it seemed like things were just exploding at the time for the band. Thankfully, Zach is extremely honest throughout our chat, where he divulges on just about everything related to his time during the band, the hiatus, and really just setting the record straight about what caused the hiatus, the prospect of the band's imminent return and reunion, especially when the timing is right. In the meantime, Zach has started a brand new project called Zachary Ross and the Divine, who released an exceptional debut EP called Rebuilding Heaven at the tail end of 2022. And I think what's so cool is that Zach is still as humble as they come, and he's very excited to be building this band largely from the ground up. Zach is such a good guy and such a great conversation, and I just want to thank him so much again for jumping on the show, and I think you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. So without any further ado... Here is my conversation with Zach Eisenstein of Man Overboard and Zachary Ross in The Divine. Well, dude, like, you know, I think there's 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 so much I want to kind of unpack here. Like, I mean, this is there's there's such a story here. And I feel like unless you want to really go back in time and talk about your early days, I feel like I would love to kind of jump in from when Man Overboard for like really started to kind of. Yeah, take sure, off. whatever you want. You know, like, so I. I want to preface this. So like when I look at a record like Real Talk and Real Talk, you know, I, I want to kind of start around that era, if that's cool with you. And, you know, with with that record and I think it immediately when it came out, I heard a lot of people kind of referring to it as like this could kind of be like the next tell all your friends, like to a degree. Like and 
I completely agree with that. I think when Real Talk came out, it was hard not to kind of think it was like an instant classic at that point. And it was such a seminal time for music, like the, the, the scene or whatever that you were coming out of at that time that you were building alongside bands like Transit, Balance and Composure, um, all these other bands, Fireworks, any of these bands. It it wasn't, it, it was to me, and I, I wrote an essay about this for AP, you know, it, it was the last time that this scene kind of felt like it still was in its VFW hall roots. It still kind of felt like it was coming from hardcore and the underground. Like there was no industry plant kind of thing. It was you guys playing shows to either 500 people or five people, you know, in a city. And, 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 you know, I, I, you know, people would kind of equate man overboard and say like, Oh, like, you know, oh, they're a pop punk revival. I, I see. I didn't see that. I felt like Man Overboard had more in common with like Lifetime or like, you know, Kid Dynamite or something like that than Blink One Eighty Two to some degree. Like from what you guys came from. So, you know, what what did that time period kind of feel like when you were like making that record? Did you kind of feel like you were a part of this huge zeitgeist of music that was happening at that time? It's funny that you say the Kid Dynamite lifetime thing because i think that came through or you picked up on that because um that's the type of kids we were like lifetime kid dynamite and um and like straight up hardcore and we when we made man overboard it was it was almost like some we, we like saves the day a lot and then we like um taking back sunday and we like brand new and we were like but but remember what well, like that being said the bands were like all time low cash cash everybody had like the haircut the neon era <laughs> yeah that's where and that's where the whole defend pop punk thing really came from we were we were like we we're, we're not like neon yeah. and, we, and we don't have breakdowns so like we were it was a throw it was a throwback kind of to us we didn't think of it like a throwback really but we were we did think of it like i remember saying things like how come there's no band nobody's putting anything out like tell all your friends right now nobody's putting anything out like your favorite weapon mm -hmm. nobody's putting anything out like that so let's be a band like that let's not have and it's, let's not have breakdowns or like we weren't really feeling like the easy core wave um and um but and to to kind of so coming from that headspace our idea was like let's make this like really poppy band let's make like the most bubblegum thing we can like we can think of so man overboard is really like some not the punkest in the world or whatever but some more punk rock or hardcore oriented kids definitely being like we want to let's try making like something what poppier than we are or let's try something as catchy as we can or um said it ties into that defend pop punk thing and yeah with the other part of your question we were totally aware of like um the thing that was greater than us with being like us uh balancing composure title fight tiger's jaw uh transit it's it's it was fireworks the wonder years it was hard to ignore that like all of these people that I was friends with my all of my friends bands were getting popular and mine was too like yeah. it was it was hard to ignore that because it, it wasn't just like oh I know title fight now because man overboard got bigger no I had known title fight since ninth grade or it wasn't like oh we know the wonder years now because we're bigger it was like no man overboard and the wonder years used to play for five people together it was happening to everybody and yeah. we were seeing everybody you would you would meet up with with someone you haven't seen in a while maybe we would we hung out with balance composure a lot like in real life because we we're only we live close yeah you know and you hang out and it's like what do you guys have going on we're we're about to go on tour with bayside and it's like whoa what about you we're about to go on tour with census fail and and we were like a, a year ago we were playing for each other in amityville you know and that's that's what um that's pretty much what it was like so we we had a lot of pride in like our friend group and um we didn't think we were like great or anything i think that we thought the other bands were great that you talk about and the other everybody was really proud of their peers there was a lot of camaraderie 
And we, we, we were definitely aware that like we were part of something cool. I don't think it was like a cocky thing or an ego no. thing on any, on any band's parts. It was more just being like, this is something's clearly happening. No, you could tell because, you know, I love that you bring up like that this was kind of a byproduct of that like neon era where everything was like, you know, there was a there was a lot of, you know, major label money behind bands like, you know, Cash Cash or Forever the Sickest Kids or something like that, you know, and, you know, your guys' scene felt like the direct antithesis to that. Like it was real people just playing songs like you know, it, Transit and Man Overboard or Balance, they look like guys that you were just friends with. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, you know, there was- it really is. Same thing with Transit. I'd known Transit from me and Tim Landers met on MySpace in like 2003 or four. So I've known everybody in all these, the, that kind of run for cover, all those bands we're talking about. We all knew each other already. We did. We either, it was from our smaller bands that happened in high school or just that we lived closer, but like, you know, Tiger's Jaw, all those bands I mentioned, to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Boston Connection was like alive in high school. All these bands that ended up being pretty popular knew each other before our fans knew any of us. Yeah, I mean, the Northwest, or not Northwest, sorry, the Northeast seemed just absolutely like the Mecca at that time. And I grew up in Seattle, so I was like the direct opposite of that. And I remember growing up and we're like, God, like, it is like, that is the Mecca out there. Of, of it music. was. And we were like, what is happening right now? Like, it's, it's crazy. But and we were just, you know, it also at the same time, after everything I said, all, the other side of that is that it happened so fast and so blurry that yeah. I'm like piecing together how I think I felt right now. And I'm pretty sure I'm right, but it's it's a blur. And, and and another thing that was that was so wild and we bring up like hardcore and stuff, just kind of touching on this era is like I actually um, I had a, a, a gifted like a framed poster of Sound and Fury like 2010. And I see it's like Man Overboard played at Sound and Fury like next to like fucking I don't know, like Trapped Under Ice or something like that. You know, like it's there's a lot of stuff that 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 people don't realize we're a lot more comfortable in that element until they say, you know, if you look at, there's people who, you know, a lot of times people follow me on Instagram for years and stuff, or take a closer look at my life and see who some of my friends are. have been like, that's good. I never saw the guy from man overboard. will hang out with the good. And I'm like, well, you know, we actually don't pick our friends based off what our music sounds like. Believe exactly. it or not. And yeah, it sounded fury was, was we did tours with, there was a man, tour once that was Man Overboard, I believe Man Overboard, Law Dispute, uh, Ceremony, and Trapped Under Ice. That is insane. <laughs> That's so cool. And w- which is crazy, though, because, okay, it was insane at that time, I guess. But now, that was such a precursor. That's normal now. That's what's so cool. That's And you guys really laid the groundwork and, and, and really had to sort of develop that. Because, like, now genre lines, you know, like anything like genre is not so much of a thing anymore this 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 uh the clicks of the music scene are not so much of a thing people are mixing and it, it's really cool that i mean obviously this probably happened in the 90s as well too but I, but I, I just love that you guys were doing that at that time because that was kind of a weird time like the internet was starting to take off a little more people were becoming a little more selective and yeah i remember sitting backstage at a show in england or something with justice from trapped under ice looking at the crowd and I'm, and we're going like i guess people that like my band like your band i guess people <laughs> that like my band like your band and me and him are like not shocked we're like you're almost like i we thought this was cool or else we would have not done it where we're just kind of nervous to make exactly. sure that, but like now, like I see, you would see during Man Overboard, you would see kids c- like freaking crying, wearing Trapped Under Ice shirts. And during Trapped Under Ice, you would see Defend Pop Punk shirts, like fucking everyone up in a pit. And we were like, this is like working somehow. This- yeah. And then, you know, Real Talk comes out and it it, it is a huge moment. And I, and I, and I, and I, I brought this up to, um, to, to Joe B, um, who's who's a friend of mine, and I and I, I love him dearly, and I and I kind of want to bring up, if if you don't mind, Man Overboard and Transit for a moment right now, because, I, and it's funny because I've talked about this with Jeff from Thursday, 
it's like Thursday and Thrice had very similar career parallels at the same time. And I feel like that was very similar with Man Overboard and Transit. And so it's like both of you guys put out these incredible records in 2010 with Real Talk and Keep This to Yourself with Transit. And at the same time, you signed to a traditionally, at the time, very like metalcore label at the time and kind of were the first new signings that kind of changed the shift of what that label was signing at the time. And I remember when that was announced, you guys literally announced it at the same time as each other. And it was this huge moment. And it was like, this is going to be massive right now. (laughs) So what did that kind of feel like when you got like linked up with Rise and then kind of like seeing that also happen with your best friends in in transit at the same time as well? Well, it's it's funny because the whole thing, I was saying we didn't want to be neon. And um, then we we got a little bigger, and, and Rise was a very neon label. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rise Records, I believe, approached Man Overboard three times. We told them no the first two times. <laughs> um, we uh, they ended up making like, really sweetening the deal. And to be fair, they ended up kind of pitching us on everything you just said. They called it, and we and we liked it. There was a dude named Matthew who worked there at the time and I remember him saying to me um I want to sign bands like like yeah like he wasn't talking shit he's like I think that um you know Miss May I and all these bands are great I love them but I want to um I want to sign bands like your band I want to sign bands like Hot Water Music I want um this I want to be I think that I remember him saying I think that like kind of referencing the neon stuff i think i remember him saying something to the effect of like i think that's on its way out Mm -hmm. and like you guys are like what's like he was being honest like you guys are gonna be like this is the vibe now like he was they were very aware of that and they were like to us they were like we want that to be the vibe of rise and we want you to help that with that and then we were like listening as far as being signed and then they're like you know we're talking to transit too so then it turned into like months of like us on the phone with transit, like, oh, what they tell you? Are you gonna do this? <laughs> yeah. And um, and then it was like, we're doing it. Are you doing it? We're doing it. OK. And then I, it might have been Rise's idea to like announce it together. But it was all very conscious. Like we were really aware of how the label was thought of. We were aware of like that we were the defend pop punk band about to like be on the same level as all these other bands. But the other thing was we had just done our first warp tour and we were with a lot of bands on warp tour who were on rise. And those bands looked like they were living well. <laughs> and we were like, like, and we were just like, uh, that's gotta be the move for us. And as far as the defend pop punk thing and the neon thing went, I think in our head, it turned into more like a, we're gonna, you ever seen the movie SLC punk? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like at the end, where Steve was like, the best way to break this system is from the inside. Yes. Like, yes. You know what I mean? yes. Like, All right. We're going to go be label mates with some bands that we really like and some bands that we aren't the biggest fans of. And we're going to try to like put our money where our mouth is with this defend pop punk thing and like destroy a piece of the scene that we don't care for, <laughs> to be completely honest with you. I wonder too, like, you know, so with Real Talk was. It, it, it came as a, sh- a surprise to so many people. It felt like at the time it was like, who the fuck is this band? And I feel like Buddy was like a huge early co-signer of the band. And I, lo- I love Buddy. He's a great guy. And, you know, I, and I think that was that was a big start to it. But I was curious, like when that record came out, I remember hearing it. And I remember my older brother showed me Real Talk. It was on a burn CD. It was really cool. And, uh, and I w- I'll never forget. I was in, actually, I had it on an iPod eventually i was in like an airport at christmas time and i was like who is this band they're gonna be fucking huge and so i wonder labels must have been knocking at your door in droves at that so were there other band like other labels that were kind of knocking at your door that you almost maybe signed with at the time like other than rise um i think that we had a i think that we talked pretty seriously with hopeless but they wanted to um I think that Hopeless and Epitaph both had offered us things for multiple albums and Rise offered us something for multiple albums and we didn't ever want to be signed for like three albums to anyone. Like we hated that idea. And then we told Rise no two times, like I was telling you. And then one day 
Rice called us back and was like, one record, one <laughs> record. And wow. then they were like, if it does good. So that's like kind of answers your question. Like people's interest was pretty sick at the time. And then they're like, so like in one record with an option, you know, so if listeners don't know if, if, if your record does X amount, then you have to do enough. If your record sells X amount, then you, we have the option to keep you for a second one. Usually that's fine because if your record sold X amount, then you're not probably that unhappy on that label. So it usually it's designed to work out for both parties. So eventually they hit us with that and we were like, oh, yeah. And then we stopped talking to everybody else. And um, yeah, but I think we talked to Hopeless and Equal Vision. Um, but really, it was like we were extremely picky. And I honestly feel we had no problem staying on run for cover if that's, sure. what, we like, if that's what we felt like we had to do. But Rise did have um, once Rise really started to like try to win us over they were able to show us that they were you know they were they are a really huge label who has some tools and stuff and when they showed us the things they can do and how they do things we were impressed you know that's really that's really cool i mean that's that's so crazy to hear that you were able to negotiate like the one album deal like because that era was like like victory was signing bands for like five album deals. And it's like, you basically just die on the label at that point. <laughs> like, and to give credit to the other guys in my band and zero to me. Um, <laughs> when the, I think probably that second time that we told rise. No, I was livid at that. Yeah. At my band. Yeah. I was like, I don't know what, what, what freaking planet you guys are living on. Like, think, what do you think that people, you wait your whole life for the people you like, I don't, what are you playing games here? These people might not ask us again. What is your problem? Because I had no ability to like, well, I mean, I could be coy, like with around other people, but it was just me and my band. I was like, dude, what are you talking about? I want to sign to the big label. And they'd be like, <laughs> chill, Zach. Like, cause I'm like 22 or 23 at the time. They'd be like, yeah trust and they, and i'm close to the youngest guy a man overboard i'm the second youngest so they'd all be like trust me please trust us like we're not we 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 have a there's a method to our madness and they were right then we got the one and we got the one offer uh deal and then a few people in the band looked at me like i told you <laughs> and then and then obviously you make the record and it is it, it, a very big success like it 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 you are able to follow up the hype, in my opinion, just virtually seamlessly. Like you, you, you did it. Like and, you know, that record was really, really important. The self-titled, you know, and I, I think, you know, did it feel like when you were making that record, like what was what was kind of going into your headspace? Like did, you knew it was that big opportunity, and you didn't blow it. So you know, what was the method behind the madness? Um, I think the method was that songwriting wise and everything, it was the same uh, process and machine as, as real talk, nothing really, it wasn't long enough for us to change as people. And it wasn't long enough for us to change as maybe as artists, it was long enough, but not for to change our creative process, like all the time between uh, real talk and self titled, we all we spent together on the road. Yeah. So it was really just like the same. It was almost just like part two. It was like, just go back. I think the only difference in my mind with self-titled and real talk is that on self-titled, I'm singing more about things that have happened on tour because that part of my life began. Real mm -hmm. talk for me, and I'm literally, this is like a completely unique, only I could feel this way. To me, you talk, uh, real talk feels different because everything I'm singing about on real talk is completely written by a boy who no one has heard of his band okay yeah no one they're they don't even exist yet really like there there's no fans there's no tour coming up there's no no one has ever even told me i'm good at like stuff and then uh the self-titled is like the only difference is self-titled like i know there's people the first time ever there was like there's people waiting for this like there's people who want me in the studio right now fans like we we got fans we did it we did it we did it so the really that's the only difference between those two to me was in my headspace was that and i felt a little like okay the ball's rolling when we made the second one so maybe i was like and i'm the type of person too that like at least with music um when i'm when i've been in situations to me where 
a lot of people would describe like high pressure things to make something good. It usually like kind of fires me up and inspires me. Honestly, I'm not, I'm at my worst when there's, when the stakes are low sure. and nobody's really counting on anything. That's what I'll just play PlayStation all day and do nothing with my life. <laughs> but when, in a situation like that, like you just put out real talk and now people are anticipating your next album. I think I've always had the type of kind of almost like a competitive personality where I'm like, we got to let's write the sickest songs ever now. Yeah. And and it just it just felt like, you know, it, it just felt like Man Overboard firing on all cylinders, you know, at, with that record, because I mean, I, I wonder if, too, because you had like what, like a year or a year and a half on the road to just become better players and actually just, you know. I think that's it. I think a year, I spent a lot of those early days on the road writing. Like, um, I think I would play shows and see kids um, react to Real Talk every night. And I think I would probably wake up the next morning on tour so inspired by that. And that's when I wrote most of the songs that I wrote on the self-titled album I wrote in the morning hours while touring for real talk, like in the back of the van or something. So I think it's just like those mornings where it's like, man, last night was crazy. Like, I can't believe my band's like totally blowing up. And like, you just grab your guitar and you're that much more stoked to write. Like you probably would have wrote a song that day anyway, but it's like better. What song would you, can you remember one specifically that kind of came from that, from that, like waking up in the morning? Just being rare. Kind of rare. I was going to ask. Yeah. I, okay. The rares also came from like, it was kind of my brain, uh, what was like all the things I'm singing about in the lyrics were like truly happening to me. And I was like in a very like emo mood. But sure. at the same time, I was like, I'm going to convey this emo mood like a beast. Like, you know what I mean? Like, this is it. Because I remember thinking like it's kind of unhealthy almost even or it may be. But I remember and I'm like 23 at the time thinking, oh, you know, I'm having – I'm so stressed out about Melanie and I'm so stressed out about like what's going on in my life and these and, and, and blah, blah, blah. But then I look at the type of music I played and I would look at the the emo and the pop punk kids and I, and in my little early twenties brain, sadly, I was like, this, it's good for me when I'm sad. People like when I'm sad, people like this is, this is going to be good for me. Oh, cool. My heart's broken. Let's, let's harm let's just like oh well we're not gonna deal with this properly we're gonna wallow and soak in all the pity because i'm gonna turn it into something sort of positive yeah uh, channeling all that stuff but like it's not it sounds kind of healthy but it's it, not in practice it was incredibly unhealthy well sure sure absolutely i mean yeah i mean that that is crazy because i mean i think so many people you know, during that time, we're looking to bands like like Man Overboard to. Oh, to and kids were giving me their. I never encouraged this at all, but there was like a trend that time where kids were giving me their razors, their razor blades. Oh my god! Yeah, that was like way more popular than somebody who never had to deal with cutting would ever would be shocked to know how many times somebody came up to me. And gave me their old razor blades that they used to cut themselves with. And I've never, never been like a mature person, like I said. So I'm still like a young guy getting like my band's getting popular for the first time. And I knew how to handle that situation as far as like, yeah, you know, you tell them, I hope you never do this again. I'm so sorry that you stopped. You hug yeah. them. You thank them. But in my head, I was like, yes, these are the – not yes, but no. <laughs> you see, Zach, these are the people. These are your people almost so it was like you don't when when my own mental health is going through things it was just like yeah of course you have these problems you're the genuine article baby that's why yeah. all these, that's why all these that's where it gets unhealthy that's why all these people relate to you that's why you're doing so good because you've got problems and it's okay that you have problems your problems are a blessing and it's like they're probably not a blessing yeah like all your fans and stuff would like you to be like doing well it's it's crazy though because you I I remember hearing like examples like I remember famously like when a guy like Max Bemis got like sober and got married and everyone was like oh his band's gonna suck now and like the fans were like mad that he like found happiness and like found his wife and it's like there is that double edged sword like I remember it happened with Senses Fail like Buddy was like I've found peace like I meditate now people were like fuck that like why are you doing that it's like 
thankfully people don't have to worry about that with me yet I'm, I've still got a, a lot of angst for someone my age but it was just like not even trying but like yeah everything you're saying I thought about stuff like that preemptively for me like people could this take away my power or something so it was it, it kind of prevented me from getting self from helping myself for a while I think because I was just like I'm meant to be this way you know it's 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 crazy that you bring that up because I, I draw a lot of parallels between like your music and sort of the the world that you kind of came up in as being kind of similar to like 90s grunge in a sense. Like you you guys were in, in, in many ways like kind of the Kurt Cobains of that generation. To I, he's my birthday buddy. Is he really? And we, have, we play the same guitar and we were both born on February 20th. Yeah. Dude, so do you want to know something crazy? So I grew up five minutes away from his house in Seattle. Oh, yeah, you're from Seattle. Yeah. So, like, have you ever been to his house in Seattle? No, but I've seen tons of pictures. I know exactly what it looks like. It, it's crazy, dude. So my girlfriend and I were back in Seattle for the holidays a couple years ago, and I took a picture of her at his bench that you can sit on, and I shit you not, when we looked at the pictures, they were like orbs around her. I have this weird <laughs> thing where with him where I don't know if it's the birthday thing. I wrote a song. It's never been released. I wrote a song for Kurt Cobain once. Wow. It's for Man Overboard. I should make it. I should put it out one day. It was supposed to be a man. I made it sound way more personal than sure. writing about than like writing about a guy whose music I listen to. But um, I've always felt this kind of like closeness to him. To a few, same with Brad Dole from uh -huh. Supply. Uh -huh. People who. Maybe it's um, maybe it's a fact that they were like songwriters who I feel like their their time got cut short. I don't know what it is, but I've always felt this like I don't want to say connection, but yeah, kind of like a connection with those guys. Um, and it is, and I think what you're talking about with the grunge and stuff is totally true because the way that we kind of wanted to regurgitate the neon pop punk scene all over the floor and wipe everybody's face in it. It was that's grunge with like hair metal with exactly exactly yeah yeah which is funny though because like Motley Crue is like my all time top three <laughs> favorite bands of my life yeah but, but that's not what my generation was rebelling against that for that's my generation that's what we saw on MTV when we were like two so if anything it's it was it's this Motley Crue and hair metal for me is like nostalgic it reminds me of being a little baby. Well, I think we can also look back on it now since so many years have passed. We can see the importance of it and actually see the great songwriting. And I bet even in like 10 years, even I find it now, I can listen to some of those neon bands and be like, you know what? Like Friday Night Boys were not that bad, you know? <laughs> like, you know like it's the other thing too, I meant to say that earlier. That was coming from a very, the whole defend pop punk, the whole anti hair neon thing was coming from that very like sheltered almost we didn't feel sheltered at the time but like northeast hardcore kid never gone on like a global tour never made any kind of real paycheck with your guitar the world was still a lot smaller we ended up opening doing direct support for all time low and being like which is the complete opposite of like everything we were going for ended up you know uh, uh being playing touring with mayday parade you know, yeah, or being yeah. next to whoever we're next to on Warp Tour, Tour with Never Shout Never, all these things that kind of ended up going against what we were saying in the first place as the years went on. We felt like we didn't change. And also, you know, like, I'm not gonna lie, All Time Low, I remember, I don't remember which one of them, but them being like, we want to take on, we want to take bands like you guys on tour. Like, we want to take, like, the bands, those kind of more neon bands were starting to notice, um, title fight and man overboard and transit and how there's like a million of them you know what i mean yeah. and um so it, it, and and then i remember eventually being like you know hey man you know maybe all time lows music's not my first choice of something to put on but man we could respect the hustle at the time like we were like there's a lot of, there's a from musician to musician band guy to band guy like wow you've built something like amazing for yourself and that's what i mean when we started to get a, our worldview got a little bigger, we got a little more mature. We had to turn into actual businessmen. You start to respect some people that you didn't respect from your couch when you were 17 years old watching YouTube. You know what I mean? And and your your view on things kind of change. But um, 
Yeah, I don't even know how I got going on that. Oh, yeah, but I'm just saying, it, it's just funny to note that we were very, like, it was like the grunge mentality, like you're saying, we didn't want to be something that, not we ultimately ended up being, but we ultimately ended up participating in, for sure. Yeah, I mean, but, like, you know, I think what's so crazy, too, though, is, like, yeah, like, you obviously won over those those bands that you were kind of the antithesis to, but then at the same time, also, like, the elder people amongst the scene, the more like scene veterans were also co-signing you very hard. Like, and it's int- like, buddy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that that's, that's a huge thing, but I feel like there were also like other bands that were even probably a little bit older than census fail at that time that were really coming out for you guys as well too, because I think people could see that you were just an authentic band. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about like older, older, yeah, I would take it back Sunday. It was really into us and really supportive and friendly and nice. Burt McCracken, it's like huge man overboard fan and like big supporter of me and like a really good friend. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was like random, like not, you know, it wasn't, it was a result of, from my perspective, it was random. One day Burt McCracken's just like hanging out with you, like your band rules. And you're like, oh, like cool, like I guess. I, and then you th- you you think back at this point. Now I'm thinking back, like, yeah, of course, Bert thought my band ruled because I wanted to. We wanted to be like that. We wanted to be like we not like the used, but like I said, I was telling you earlier, we wanted to be like his time. We wanted to be like Taking Back Sunday. We wanted to be like brand new. We wanted to be like stuff that he was used to. So when you're in, if you're a guy in Taking Back Sunday, or you're a guy in the used. I could see scratching your head at some of the bands that were on Warped Tour at the time and then looking at us and being like, ah, a good old fashioned catchy ass pop punk band. Just no, no gimmicks really besides our massive gimmick, which is our t-shirt. No, no. (laughs) You know, and the same thing like anti-flag, like we grew up like punk kids, like I was saying, anti-flag was so supportive of us. would be like standing on the side of the stage watching us all the time. Um, yeah older bands too and it was crazy buddy though was the first buddy was the first buddy hit me up on myspace like twitter and everything didn't even exist and i had to be 20 years old and there was probably only four man overboard songs and we recorded them all or like or no it was like we had love your friends die laughing which we recorded at our on our own um it was like the, our only song probably on MySpace, maybe a couple other ones. And one day it was like, Census Fail wants to be your friend. And I love Census Fail. And I was like, nah, like this isn't real. And then like he messaged me and I'll never forget, Buddy messaged me. And I was like, dude, like I can't believe you're talking to me. Like I love Census Fail and all this stuff. And he was like, I live in New Jersey. Let's go get dinner. And I think like 24 hours later, we were at a diner. That's crazy. <laughs> Dude, it's it's so funny. I would say Buddy is probably one of the few people I have like borderline fanboyed over because my girlfriend actually is uh, his day to day manager uh, for Census Fail now, and so I but I met Buddy a couple years ago and we actually worked on some music together. And I remember just thinking in my head like, "Oh my god, this is Buddy! <laughs> like this is insane! <laughs> like so crazy!" And he's the first person I ever knew from the band that. Um that I was like a really, really massive fan of let it unfold you. And, um, from the depths of dreams, their EP were both like really big, really massive influences on the way that I write songs. Yeah. And a lot of the things that I do that I think a lot of, you know, just the stuff that makes my songs me come from like, uh, Garrett and playing guitar. So the way that buddy, uh, wrote words and stuff, um, on their first couple albums, they were a really big influence on me. And buddy knows that now me and him are, we've known each other for years now. So uh, the, the, um, it's funny. I almost think of it. It's hard for me to believe sometimes that that's that guy that I love him to death. It's just hard for me to believe that's that, that's that dude who made those incredible records because when they came out, I loved them so much and I didn't know him at all. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's wild. And I really want to, I want to unpack kind of your songwriting and what makes you, you in just a moment, but but just to kind of close that off too, is like, not to mention, you know, two records later after the self-title, you did a record with Bill Stevenson, right? Like, so it's like, you know, it's like you, you, you did that as well too. So like, that's an elder statesman co-signing you. Like, that's like the biggest one. Yeah. Like like the only one, if you got that one, that's, that's all of them. 
Yeah. And it works that way too. It's funny, like if to be other as the years go on, be people like, Oh, you're a man overboard. Cool, that's cool, man. We did our last record with Bill Stevenson. What? You guys record Bill Stevenson? Oh my god. I remember people in huge bands way bigger than mine being like, I want to record with Bill Stevenson. How did you do that? And I'm sitting there like, oh no, he just did it. And then Rise paid him. Yeah. They sent an email. There was an invoice. That was it. <laughs> down. Bill was down. And same thing. Bill was so nurturing to me on the topic of your question with the songwriting and everything. So I'm all hyped and I get there and, you know, I'm with Bill Stevenson. This guy started the Descendants and Black Flag. This is like the first, not only that, he wrote the Descendants songs. He's like the first pop punk kid ever. And I'm sitting there like nervous as heck the first day. And I remember a few nights and he busted out his acoustic guitar and he's like, and it's just me and him and I'm smoking weed and Bill's just drinking coffee. And it's like one in the morning. And he's like, and he goes, Want to hear some songs I'm working on for the Descendants? Oh my! God. And I was like, "Yeah, please." And he's like, and he grabs the guitar and he starts playing me songs that he's writing. Yeah. And he let me in that night to like how his brain works, and and from and that was really early on in the record. So during Heavy Love, I think I spent a lot of the time being mentored by Bill for writing songs, um, for writing pop punk songs, and. Um, I, I, it was invaluable. We learned so much from him and little things were, were so little to him. That was, it was so refreshing where we were coming from and 99% of producers were like, you know, every little thing has to be perfect. And maybe your voice sounded weird. Do that line again. Whereas Bill would be like, oh, your voice sounded weird, but it was cool. You sound like you let's keep it. Like, uh, he just really thought. He really, we thought that Bill was going to have the most like intense approach out of anyone that we'd ever worked with, but it was the most chill. With Heavy Love, really quickly, it's funny that you mentioned that because to me, I think Heavy Love sounds like your most like uh, fully realized record. Like it feels like the cleanest record. With Bill, I think Bill has a lot of the, all that technical or, um, you know, the that 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 TLC still goes into it. And there's other people who work with Bill who are incredible engineers and stuff at the blasting room. Yeah. He usually focuses on more of like the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. You know, Bill, I'm thinking about making the second verse of this song only half the length. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, no. Or yeah, actually, I was thinking the same thing. Like he would, we would talk about stuff like that. Is this a weird lyric? Is it weird if I say this? Like, is it... um, you know, like stuff like that. Am I embarrassed? Like you could, I, we really talked about stuff. It wasn't like, it was almost like he was so professional that things like snare tones and, and guitar tones and stuff were obvious and assumed and, and came second. Let's talk about like you and the song, you know? Yeah, it was, it, I, I would imagine he's probably like, dude, I've, I've done so many records. I you're, you're in good hands. Like, here we go. <laughs> and he was really interested, which was nice. He, he was really interested in me and what the songs were about. Like, I remember recording one song sometime. I don't remember which one and him saying him like, pause, like we're working and him just like pausing and like leaning back in his chair, hitting the space bar, man. Like I've been, this song reminds me of a song that I wrote once. And then I go, Oh yeah. And he's like, yeah, and yeah, because this is what was going on with me and this girl. And now, and that reminds me, it sounds like that's the situation you're in, too, judging off the lyrics. And I'd be like, dude, yeah, like blah, 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 blah. Then we'd stand there talking about girls for 12, like, <laughs> two minutes. And then maybe at the end of the day or when we're eating dinner, he'd be like, hey, remember earlier I was telling you about that song that reminds me of blah, blah, blah? Yeah. And he'd be like, this is it. And then we'd all sit there and listen to the Descendants and eat. That's so crazy. <laughs> and he'd be like, and blah, 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 telling me, you know, the parallels and stuff. He was really, he cared a lot about like the the emo-ness. I think he saw a little guy in me with like a lot to say and in my head we were like getting more mature at that point but I'm, I'll, I'll always be a kid to Bill and I think that he was just like this kid's this kid's uh got something to say and was really interested in that more so than just like making the record sound awesome which is nothing uh, wrong with I'm not complaining about it or throwing any kind of shade at any other producers sure year. that was the difference I love that. And, you know, I want I want to go back in time a little bit to, to Heart Attack, because I feel like that's that's such an important part of this of this story as well. 
And it's it's crazy, like, just to kind of set the stage for it. It's like, okay, so the self-tile record is is very successful. People love it. And once again, you're able to follow it up with another very successful record that I think people, I think people are often split, like either that's like one of their favorite records or maybe self-titled or real talk, but it's like, there's a trilogy of those three records, no matter what, that people are, are absolutely love those records. So with like Heart Attack, you know, obviously a lot you you already are swept up into the music industry machine at that point i'm i'm imagining and you're you're playing you've already played a full warp tour in 2012 like you've you're you're doing these huge tours you know and you know what do you what do you feel about like heart attack like looking back like did, was it exactly what you intended yeah it was heart attack was emotional um heart attack from my point of view, may probably after real talk is the most emo one. Uh-huh. Uh, it, uh, yeah, uh, we wanted to get into. I was not, you know, as I guys, I um, wanted to get into more expressing stuff around heart attack with like I was. Re- I have always been really into Thursday, and been really into the used personally and. Um, scre- I wanted to scream. I remember yeah. that. Um, the song "Sad," uh, stuff like that. Like I wanted to, um, I wanted us to be a little more. I was like, "It's getting real, you guys." Like the difference to me was like, and it was a reflection of things going on in my own head. I felt like the first two albums were kind of like, um, no, oh, you know, this girl doesn't like me. But I have very suburban eighteen-year-old problems. And with yeah. Heart Attack, it was like, you know, I have 20, I have people in your 20s problems. Yeah. And I have people in your 20s um, depression now. It's different. Yeah. And uh, but and so to answer your question, the mindset, like writing it was the same as like I was saying before, just draw off. It was that same unhealthy. Oh, great. This is this is what let's just they let's just bleed. Let's just let's just oh, I'm bleeding. Let's just cut it open and bleed. Yeah. Out. I want to make something that's sad. I want people to cry. I want people to be upset, not just like um, like moaning. Like yeah. I I feel worse than and this is me at the time. I feel worse than Man Overboard sounds. Okay. Yeah. Like I feel worse than we're not really doing my uh mood justice anymore. It, like it's 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 bad in my brain sometimes and and what do you know guess what turns out my job is to sing about when it's bad in my brain so let's just lay into it so i mean to answer your question so i never because of sometimes mental health issues relationship issues whatever was going on with me i did use that as some sort of fuel and be like oh well i'm not nervous about having to write new songs i got all the gasoline in the world exactly yeah. Like, so it was just the same old thing. It was the same old thing every time. Um, it's I. It's nice hearing you say that. Like we went back into the studio and hit it out of the park again. And it's just. I, I think that's a result of it. Just the the bullshit in my brain, just like never stopping. And I just kept that same. And I I do to this day. It's just about like getting that out there. I like being like as real, almost embarrassing myself as much as possible. <laughs> And I think that's like, that all began with real talk. I mean, heart attack. Yeah. I mean, not to mention too, like the first single that you put off, put out from it was White Lies, which to me is, is a heavier sound to Man Overboard. And I thought that was really cool. It's about not, it's about going somewhere and being like, everybody here hates me. I literally have no friends here. Like, they, like they don't, I'm like not popular. I'm not cool. No one's talking to me. I'm not standing in this, The I, I want to go home. But yeah. like I knew that I could make that like you can make you can sing that so it sounds like you could sing that song so it sounds like an all time low song or you could express that sentiment so it was more like Thursday song and it felt way more in line with Thursday than all time low absolutely I wanted to be like this is like darker like you said like yeah I'm just kind of complaining about nobody at this party liking me but it's like a dark complaining it's a very mature this is not this is not a superficial little kid eighth grade birthday party this is like why is I'm starting to feel hopeless in life yeah, absolutely and then you know you have songs like how to hide your feelings and stuff like that on the record and it, it yeah I mean it was a much darker record and 
it, it, it worked. And then not to mention too, like when that record came out, it felt like it was such a moment. It felt like it was kind of like the, you would kind of eclipsed what Man Overboard was. Like everything kind of came together with like the heart attack imagery played in with the defend pop punk imagery and everything like that. You do this massive heart attack tour where you're headlining and you've got transit with you. You've got knuckle pop. You've got forever came calling. And I, and I, and I, I'm friends with Joe from forever came calling. I torture him all the time, like asking him about that tour. Cause I was like probably 19 or 20 when I went to that tour and it was, I went to it at chop suey in Seattle. I, I remember that. It was a crazy tour. It seemed like it really felt like this, this huge victory lap for the band after a successful record cycle. Did it feel like that? It did. It did. Um, for me, I don't know if everybody in the band felt that way, to be completely honest with you. Not that they weren't proud of the record. I think that might be the beginning of where some people in our band started to get like tired. Um, not me again, but like yeah. for me, it was like, yeah, kind of like a victory lap or kind of just like, I tried to never, think of it like it was over like so i was just like a continuation of the parade maybe it's like more like it you know what i mean it's like i always thought okay so we're getting we're getting bigger we're bigger than we were last month we're bigger than we were last month we're bigger than we were last month um and now it's like so at that point i was probably just on that ride still you know i i sure. didn't think I, I had a I, my head was in the clouds like a lot of times a lot of the stuff I tell you today is remembered in like retrospect sure. um, when that stuff was going on I think I was just living it up on top of the world probably probably a little bit more than I should have been but yeah those were the craziest but really really some of the best times um, I don't think I was too aware of it being like a culmination of anything i just thought we had probably we had done good again and we're continuing to get new fans and it's interesting to bring up like i and i and i feel like i've read it some places but yeah like i mean this was probably around the time where some people in the band were like you know maybe wanting to get married and like settle down and like have some kids and stuff like that which is yeah, that's when that snowball started rolling i think which is wild because the band had really only been you know, touring at that level for what, like three years at that point, really like three, four years and fast rides. So, you know, you're going into heavy love, you know, coming up off of that. And you're, and you're kind of saying like already some people were kind of already like, Hey, like, I don't know if I want to go this hard anymore, you know, like, and I'm sure like you're, you're young at the time that you mentioned, like you're like one of the youngest members of the band. Like you're like, fuck that dude, let's go forever. <laughs> like, let's do this. You know, that must've been hard. There's still days I wake up and I'm like, fuck that. Let's go forever. Yeah. Uh, the the Zach in his 30s understands a lot more. I did not at the time. Sure. I, at all. I understand um, that you only get one life to live and a certain amount of years on this planet. And that people want to do as an, an, any number of things with that time. I understand that. Um, sure. Uh, it was but yeah like i'm not gonna lie at the time i was like so quit the band yeah i was like so quit you don't want to do it anymore so quit yeah um because well like I, it, it was presented to me that um and it wasn't that like harsh at first i'm like screw you dude you want to have a kid so it was more like <laughs> yeah. you know after a while i would be more like well that's okay like if you don't I'm just kind of saying, you know, it felt it felt kind of like as much as I support them, the simple way of saying this, as much as I support everybody with their family and their dreams, it felt like my band was being stopped without me having any kind of say in that at all. Yeah. Where I, where I felt like the traditional thing you do, whether someone's friends or not, and this isn't me understanding them as friends in my mind, then this would be them and being my friend. I just felt like, you know, since when, since when I was mad at them for a while, because I was like, since when do you decide you don't want to be in a band anymore? And the band breaks up. I always thought that when you don't want to be in a band anymore, you quit the band. And, you know, so then that, that obviously didn't go over well with some, with some people. And I can talk about all this stuff. Like we're all, we're all good again. Everybody, yeah. they're my best, they're my best friends, but like, yeah. but yeah, no dude, I was like not having it. Not, and not um 
uh, into it at all. And if you would have asked me the question you just asked me then, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be able to answer you for alternative press because I would I would be go I would be going off and say I was. It seemed like the most ludicrous thing in the world to yeah. me. Yeah, but it didn't to them. They didn't. Um, see the band as something which i understand we weren't millionaires from man overboard sure the the bills were paid um we weren't we had friends who had normal jobs who had as much or more money than us a normal not crazy job like we weren't so like from that i can see i could see their standpoint where they were like i need to someday make like or i want to someday make more money than this but personally i was like I don't, me, and I can't, I'm sorry, I can't change this about myself. I was like, I'm fine with this amount of money slash not done. Like, I just thought we were, we'll get bigger. We're not going to get smaller. You know what I mean? Exactly. It's it's so crazy that you bring that up because I, you know, I, I've i seen previous, it, it, there's a parallel here. I remember when um, Under Oath was, were first going on hiatus, Spencer was very much like, fuck that. Like, I don't want to stop. Like we are at our biggest right now. Why, why would we want to do that? So I, I'm curious too. like, I can, I can understand how, you know, frustrating that must've been at the time. So, but you guys still do go back in and make another record. And it's, it's interesting to me because with heavy love, I think heavy love is a great record. And I think in some ways, I don't know if you would agree, but it's maybe a bit of a misunderstood record. Oh yeah. For some reason it's been like, it, it was not received. People tell me nice things about it all the time. And nobody ever tells me, like, it sucks, but it never got received like the other ones did. And I think that scared the other guys in Man Overboard way more than it freaked me out, if we're being real. Yeah, I mean, I I wonder if, you know, because would you say that maybe going into the record with that mindset where some other people were maybe, you know, already kind of tired, that could have maybe affected some of the songwriting? Because, like, to me, I think the record's great. I think it's your, and I say this to a lot of artists, but I feel like it's, your guys is Pinkerton. Like, oh, that's awesome. You know, it's a great, it's a great record. I think people, you know, even I, I, I find myself going back to it way more now. Like I listen to a song like Splinter and I'm like, this is a great fucking song. Like, you know, or like borderline, anything like that. I think that they might've had those planted things planted in their heads, but I think that had real talk been received the other way that the other ones were, we might not have taken the hiatus as, as, as soon. I think the hiatus, like, I don't think they were all the way there going into Heavy Love. They were just kind of like, eh. Like, it would have helped a lot if the next record, like, did better. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, um, you know, we we thought it was really good. We thought it was different. We thought we were just, like, building and stuff. And like I said, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't reviewed negatively. And early, earlier when you asked me, like, how do I feel you know, was, was heart attack, like a victory lap. And I'm like, ah, I just kind of felt like I was doing my thing. Well, here I've always been kind of like that. So let's say, so now they go, Oh, you know, nobody heavy loves, not as popular as blah, 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 blah. Oh no. The same way I wasn't taking a victory lap is the same part of my brain that when that happened, I was like, Oh, well, I said like, literally I'm a, I've been listening to rock and roll my whole life. I can't name you one band. That goes bang, 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 bang. Every single record rule. You got one. It's okay. Sure. It's okay. Yeah. Like, you can have one that's like people. People make terrible records and come yeah. back. We didn't even make a terrible one. Not at all. <laughs> so that was kind of like my thing. They're like, oh, it's not the same. You see, Zach. Like you see the streams, or you see T-shirt sales, or, like dipped this month, or like blah blah blah. And I would be like, at that time, I'd be like, so so they dipped. Like, I'm not so, we'll get them back up. Like, I don't know. Maybe we need to make a better album then. Maybe not everything we do is going to be eaten right out of our hands for the rest of our lives. And that's okay. I can live with that. Like, maybe some things require a little bit of effort sometimes. Maybe you have to, like, I don't know. It's just not always going to be super easy. That's how I looked at it. So I was never, I don't think any kind anything that stressed them or worried them after Heavy Love worried me as much. And and there's two schools of thought. You could say that's because I'm more unrealistic and less grounded. I am more immature. I think of things like a child. Or you could just be like, you could say I'm looking at it the real mature way. Sometimes things take work. Well, I also think during that time, like when that record came out, 
the industry landscape was already changing a bit. And it's so weird to think, but by the time Heavy Love was coming out, you guys were almost like the elder statesmen of the scene that you started there. There were younger bands coming out and it was becoming a little more oversaturated. And, you know, we won't call it any bands, but there were a lot of bands that were coming out where you're like, okay, like you took this one part of Man Overboard, you took this one part of Story So Far, you took this one part of Transit and kind of just made this thing. And then it kind of turns into this bastardization, like all good genres, you know? It's like, I'm not the biggest fan of a band like Bush. And it's like, Bush is like, because they listened to a ton of Nirvana and they were like, whoa, we can do this too. You know what I'm saying? Like, would you say like it was kind of a weird time at that point too, like in the industry, like things were changing and it was a little saturated? Yeah, when Man Overboard first started, like local band, like we we could only there were never there were no pop punk shows to play. We yeah. only played hardcore shows because we didn't want to go play with the neon kids. Yeah. So we would so we would play hardcore shows. And I remember years later being like, yo, remember when there were like literally like sitting at at uh, at Warp Tour, half the bands are pop punk 2015. Half of the bands are metalcore and looking at my band go, remember when there was no pop punk bands for us to play with? How yeah. insane. Is, that's like the most ridiculous thought in the world now. Yeah. Uh, like, um, so yeah, like it, I guess we kind of felt, I never felt like put off by it though, because I sure. was like, Oh, I was, I thought it was great. I was like something that we we're the, we're the, like you said, we're kind of like, we did it first. And now we have like this status I thought that was great to like make it make what I do validate what I do by having there be more of us. And it's not going to take away from other people getting fans or attention is not going to make people not like man overboard less. It just, I know how music works. It just makes me a little more status in this scene. That's how I, I never felt threatened by that or bummed out by it at all. In sure. any way, I was like, this is great. If there's 10,000 pop punk bands smaller than man overboard, that means this month we can go on tour with these four bands and the tour will rule. Next month we can go on tour with these four bands and the tour will rule. Yeah. So like, I just looked at it as like awesome, but I can see how there's a pattern where a lot of people saw something as a negative that I saw as a positive. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, but like with that time, so like the record comes out, you guys do go on warp tour, I believe that summer. And, but, but seemingly within the next year and, and, and I hate to draw the parallel again, but, you you dis you go on hiatus in 2016 at the very similar time that you know transit goes on hiatus as well too which is very wild to think so you know what ultimately led to that hiatus you know how and i have a question that will come later after this that I, i've been wanting to ask for years but um but sort of like what led to the hiatus and sort of you know at that moment what did that feel like you know what what was going on you know it's funny in a way it's it's funny that I'm in some ways I'm the worst person to ask what led to the hiatus in the band, but I'm the only person in the band that would be probably talking to alternative press about anything at the moment. So um, from, from, from what I gather, I feel it's like, you know, they, they probably did feel some sort of external pressure to like do more with their days before they um, got a little bit older. Um, We hit a point where we came home from tour and, um, and I'm not blaming anything. This is not what, why at one point, um, Nick's wife was pregnant with their first uh, daughter. They have two now. Um, and, uh, Justin was getting married mm-hmm. and he has a daughter now as well that he's adopted. But at that time he was like, I'm trying to get the ball rolling. I think he was realizing he wanted to adopt a kid. Yeah. Which is like a years long process. And mm-hmm. especially when his, his daughter, he has the cutest little girl and she comes from Korea. So that was like a he had to go back and forth with Korea. Yeah. Um, and so it was kind of put to me probably to just keep me from freaking out that this is a hiatus and blah blah blah. I was under the impression we would come back in like a year or two. Yeah. Um, and then I would figure something out to do for a year. Um my only regret is that I think it was put I helped perpetuate that idea to our fans that we would be back sooner than we were, but I didn't do that maliciously. I don't mean mean to sound so dramatic when I say this. I just can't think of another way of saying it, but I was misled as well. 
Yeah. Like I passed on information that ended up not being true. I don't think anybody ever lied to me. I don't, I just think the world life didn't go how they maybe thought it was going to. So I ended up making it seem like Man of War was coming back. I ended up getting people's hopes up, my own. I yeah. ended up and like, and then that kind of gets us to like the new band. But um, it was it would t- like, dude, they they wanted to start families and stuff. And to be completely real with you, man, I think they wanted to take a little break and get back to it. And um, some of them, I think that I may have in that break, made them feel like getting back into the band full time. And this would be totally my fault if it's the truth. I may have made them feel like getting back into the band full time would be more trouble than it was worth. Like sometimes I was afraid that I like scared away a timid dog. Like sure. already had people being like, oh, we're not sure if we want to do this. And then my first reaction was like, what, what are you talking about? Blah, 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 blah. And it might have been like, OK, I definitely want to take a break now. Yeah. Which like I did that. I was emotional. And it's like I said, I talked to Justin today. I talked to Nick the other day. I, we're fine. Everybody's. Like they're my brothers. Yeah, you, you fight with your brothers sometimes. Of course. Um, but and yeah, I, so um, Nick ended up having a studio. Justin got a really good job in California, and um, we wanted to do some shows. Uh, COVID got in the way. We still talk about rescheduling them sometimes. Um, but life just like continued to happen. We uh, for all of them and. No, like it happened for me too. It's just that I've been trying to put all my eggs into more of a musical basket than anything else, and um, it just didn't. It hasn't. It, it's really hard to get everybody to be in that headspace again where they all want to do it. And it's like I said, I'm not mad at them. Of course, I understand. But but just so like you know, our fans or anybody listening knows that it's like I um yeah I I wish Man Over War was still a band like I do. I do and I don't because I'm really thankful for what I got going on now. But like, I didn't want to. I want them to have all their. I want them to have all their stuff, and that's most important that my friends have the life they want. But do I wish uh, that we went a little longer? Yeah. Did I understand the hiatus? No, not really. Um, and I, I didn't. I, I understood, but I didn't. I couldn't deal. I yeah. That you know that brings me to my next question. You know, uh, so to preface like. My favorite song you have ever written is actually not a, a Man Overboard song. It's a Bright Green song. And, oh, wow. Uh, yes, 100%. And um, I think it's that's that's Heaven Beside Me. That is that is my favorite song you've ever written. And and I've always been curious, is that song kind of about the breakup of the band? Yes, absolutely. That song's okay. about everything you just talked about, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because you're like, no band, no, not, like, nothing or whatever you're saying. I say, yeah. I, I, say okay. I say, I say, no band, and now I'm nothing. And when you said I was ripped from a dream, like, that, I, I got chills just saying that, because, like, to me, that is so insane, like, that you were able to put that into a song. And- yeah, well, and that, so if you take that song, that pretty much encompasses that difficult Zach that I'm referencing with that might have, that might have made them be like, yeah, dude, like, what, screw this, like, for a period of time. Like I said, we got over everything. Sure. That might have that might have made them not want to talk to me for a month. <laughs> but like I wasn't I didn't couldn't have I couldn't have cared less, honestly, at that point. To sure. I needed to I knew I needed to I needed to make music. That's like a need of mine. And I knew that like saying stuff like that. And it's just like always, I always operated, I always wrote my best song singing about what was happening to me. Well, this was the first time I could ever sing about not having a fucking band you know what i mean so like it was like oh we're gonna we're gonna dive into this plus and yeah in the most like superficial of layers like yeah i thought that was a cool lyric just being like real it hit so hard for me i remember when it came out i was graduating college and i was moving to la from washington and my band at the time was going on hiatus and I heard that song and I was like, oh God, it's the worst. That's it, exactly what it's about. You have you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Everything that you've probably assumed about that song, you're right about. <laughs> no, I mean I, I love that. That kind of brings me to my next question that 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 will tie into everything that's going on now with, with Zachary Ross and the Divine and everything. It's like no matter what project that you've done, whether that be Bright Green, Zachary Ross and the Divine is 
it no matter what, if you put your voice on a song it, 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 and, and your lyricism, it, it, it's a Zach song. And, and, and it does seem like it's this innate thing that you have to get that out of you at all times, you know? And before I get too over a track, I, another thing that I, um, so we actually, we do a separate show uh, separate of this too, where we do a round table with some of my friends that are big fans of music. And a big thing that we've actually brought up before is your electronic side project from like a few years. I, I think, was it called Farpoint? I believe is that what it was called? Farpoint. I've had two actually. Yeah. Yeah. My first one, I did also made a project a few years ago, like another electronic thing uh, for fun during COVID called Echo DDT. But um, I did a uh, Farpoint. Yeah. Farpoint was, <laughs> Um, Farpoint, I think, might have been paid for by Rise Records to be made. That's crazy. So when I, so I, I just want to quickly before I tap, tap, touch on that, I want to touch on that really quickly because my my friends would kill me if I didn't bring it up. But um, you know, when I first heard that, and I and I brought this up to my friend recently because we were like talking about how you know like hyper pop is like a big thing. That felt very proto hyper pop and i don't think you realized what you were doing at that time like yes i could kind of hear a little bit of like maybe like the secret handshake like inspiration there that was just i finally got uh i just started messing around for the first time in my life with making songs with a computer and then i was like oh cool i need to make a record like this and it's crazy though because it's like it was so different from man overboard but it still gave you the exact same emotional response like when you listen to it like i think the song was called make you mine i feel like that's what it was called uh bring you home bring you home bring you home yes that song dude that song is fucking incredible and and it's it's really cool because like here it is you're doing this like weird like balls to the wall like electronic like hyper pop thing but it sounds like you like in every aspect and that's so cool about about all the projects that you've done and you know that that kind of brings us now to like zachary ross and the divine like and i i've been curious too like the album is called rebuilding heaven and i wonder is that is that a reference to that's heaven beside me a little bit uh, yeah. exactly exactly yeah it's the whole heaven thing with me started when the hiatus started i came like hyper fixated on religious stuff for some reason with sure. and um yeah that 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 um the heaven i'm referring to in both cases isn't even just man overboard it's bigger than that it was man overboard but it's the you know all your, your identity own. yes uh, yeah and knowing and yeah your identity in the life feeling like you're right in the world. You have a, you know, for all the mental health and BS and everything I talk about, I was so, the other side of the coin is that part, part of me was, was happier than he had ever been during this, ever, not even close. And yeah, so rebuilding heaven is like, let's get it back. Absolutely. And I, and I thought it was so powerful to lead with, with, uh, I believe it's a light over Massachusetts, like such a cool song to put out and, you know, to, to reference, you know, like I, I it's crazy, you know, that, that year that Tim passed, like I actually lost two very good friends that year. And I'll tell you what, I never, I never knew Tim Landers at all. I only met him once and I remember bawling my eyes out when he passed away because his music meant so much. And to, to me personally, and, you know, I was just re-listening to that song this morning, you know, just leading up to this interview. And it's such a beautiful tribute to him. And, you know, I think it's one of the best songs I ever wrote. It is. It is, dude. It really is. There's like, to me, there's three choruses in the song, like three different chorus parts. And like, when you can do that, that's pretty insane where every part can kind of feel like a chorus. Um, Writing that song was different than anyone I ever wrote because usually I write songs in like under an hour and I wrote um, A Light Over Massachusetts in like three months because it just, like I would write like, I would work on that song for 15 minutes and then I would just start crying. It was too soon. Like I was writing it in my notepad on the, in the car coming home from Tim's funeral. Yeah. 
So I was like, there was lots of times where I would like write some good, I'd write a lyric and be like, oh, that was good. That's really good. I'm going to do something else right now or else I'm going to cry. So like, that's yeah. written in like spurts, you know, but Tim, Tim passing away, um, lit a big fire. It wasn't the, the entire fire. It was like 50% of my flame for starting the divine though. I think like I, I should have made the divine. I wanted to, I would have made the divine probably anyway. Um, or maybe not, but I, I, that when that happened, it was like, you have to go, you have to get up now. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to, you have to get up now for your boy and you stop whining about whatever didn't go your way. And just like, you know, it's the normal stuff. Everybody thinks when someone really close to them passes away about life being short, doing things to honor people that you cared about and all those things going through my brain. And yeah, losing Tim lit a huge, huge fire under my butt to like, I got to not to be like overly like emotional sounding or whatever, but it's like, I got to get this done now for both of us. Now, now it's like, let's say I was feeling, I'm sitting home one night wallowing in self-pity and I'm like, I've been, ever, nobody wanted to be in man overboard anymore. I've been cheated. Tim. All right. I just saw what cheated really is now. And I'm, and now I'm like, there's me and Tim ain't both beat. There's no way we're both beat. Like there's no way he's going to pass away and I'm going to sit at home and do nothing. That ain't happening. No. Like I got, I got to do this for like, for both of us almost now. And I'm really close with Tim's dad. I talk to him a lot. And that's like our, our, our thing too. Kind of It's like, yeah, I'm always telling him like, I'll post a picture of a divine flyer or something. Tim's dad will comment and be like, and I'll be like, <laughs> and I'll be like, he's with me. And yeah. Tim's dad's like, he is. And like, that's we talk so about beautiful. that stuff all the time. And, uh, you know, his, his father will tell me all the time that he's, he's with me when we're doing this shit. And, I tell his dad that he's with me and um, it's really so much of this is for me. I don't mean to like sound like I'm not a selfish guy, but no. so, but so much of this is for Tim too. with this band, like so much Tim was supposed to be, we were supposed to be making a record together. He was supposed to be making albums for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now at least I'm going to sing about him for the rest of my mind and yeah. has to think about everybody's got to think about him now i'm making it that that's the case you know what i mean i love i know dude that is so beautiful thank you for sharing that you know it, it, it's so cool i mean it's it's so crazy too like you listen to the to the to the ep of the record you know rebuilding heaven like you know it, it does feel like there is this fire underneath you, you know, and I, I can tell you are pulling a little bit from those hair metal influences a little bit like, and you're, and you're like, you're proud about it. Like you're wearing the Motley Crue shirt. Like, and I love that. And I feel like that, that to me feels so triumphant because it's like, you know, you're rising from this tragedy and you're, you're bringing kind of the fun back into the music. Like you got what you needed to say out about, you know, about Tim's passing and honoring tribute. But now it's like, let's let's fucking go like let's, that, let's that's exactly it and that was our thought process too with putting out um a light of massachusetts first it's like hey yeah i want to honor my friend i want to get this out there first and foremost rest in peace to my boy that yep. type of thing. um also it doesn't hurt that you know i think of all i thought that musically and i think tim would agree with me um i thought that musically a light over Massachusetts would, regardless of what it was about, I thought that it would appeal to man overboard fans and yeah. help, and help me out like musically. Then I struggled for a couple of weeks thinking like going back and forth, like, Hmm, am I using my dead friends like passing to like further my shit or something? No. Like, and then I thought about when I landed on what would Tim say if he knew everything or if he knows wherever the, if he, if he was, if he could talk to me right now and all the circumstances were just out in the open with everything is what it is, then would be like, would you do that? You have the right. I mean, you saw the, you saw the world with him. You, you, you came of age with him like that, that, you know, that's your brother. 
the label asked us if we wanted to make a music video for a light over Massachusetts. And I said, no, because it was the type of thing where it was like, I don't, I don't want to make this cheesy. I don't want to be like Puff Daddy when Biggie died. Sure. Sam- sampling someone else's song and then making millions. Like, it's weird. I wanted it to be like from the heart, something original. And then, yes, it's a single because I want people to hear it. But I didn't want to do a video because I really didn't want to like over. I wanted to just be like, hey, this sucks. It's nothing cool. And now let's. And then, like you said, I went on a tangent. So then the the, the point was that with the next song we put out, Push Start was going to be really fun. And it is such a fun song. And I feel like it feels like the sum of all of your projects kind of converging in one song. It's really cool. It's it's um one thing that Push Start has that I know that I tried to tap into that I would be complimented on a lot in my younger days was like a level of sassiness, if you will. Yeah. People, especially um, more so girls used to tell me, I love how sassy you are. <laughs> Something. <laughs> When we were starting the band, I never ex- anticipated ever. That never crossed my mind, but it ended up being something I was told all the time, all the time. Yeah. And, and I was like, uh, so I tried to like tap into that push because push starts about being like, hey, girl, you had your chance. Goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like the opposite of a lot of man overboard. A lot of man overboard songs like, please, please. please. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I was like, let's have fun with it and be sassy and be mean and like keep it it's kind of a mean song like i want to and some of the songs on real talk are sassy and mean um parting gift is sassy and mean. oh yeah and that song's just like i hope you die in a house fire it's like, yeah. I don't, like that's, uh, that's, that song's ridiculous so it was kind of like that, that to me and like you said there's definitely um uh, with the hair metal influences it was just like okay well let's look let's look at the positives of of not having to share the creative uh, decisions with anyone you can make this like super zach you can make this like as zach as as hell so yeah uh, into like maybe i probably there, there's a lot of things musically on that record that the, wouldn't be on a man overboard record yeah i mean yeah like there's a, like there's there's some shreds like there's actually like shredding guitar on it which is so cool and i mean just like yeah like everything about it just feels very it it, it feels fun it feels like I mean, even just watching the video for Push Start, it's like just seeing you like having fun with your friends walking around. I, I'm assuming that's like Philly that you're walking around in. Uh, New York. New York. Okay. Okay, cool. That's real whiskey. We're drunk as hell in that video. And I love that. Like, I, I think. Hop the train. And yeah, that's a real, that's, that video is real. The, I was bumping into people. The dude with the camera is like, walk backwards. Just walk backwards down the subway right now. And I was like, okay. And you can see me in the video <laughs> going like this. Because I'm trying to make sure I'm not bumped, but it's real. So it's all very real. I love that. And yeah, just, you know, with that record, like, you know, when it came out with, with Smart Punk Records, which is super cool and everything like that. So, you know, like, you know, where where do you feel now with like, with Zachary Ross and the Divine? Like, you know, obviously you have a tour coming up with, with handguns, which is fucking awesome. Um, it's such a cool, like kind of full circle moment, you know? That was my idea. That was my yeah. idea. I like to tell people it's kind of an exaggeration and a joke, but I, I like to tell people that everybody's been saying, I didn't know handguns is still playing shows. And I go, yeah, they're doing it. Cause I told them to. <laughs> and is, is Taylor like back on vocals again and everything? Cool. Sick. I think they might have someone filling in for drums, but the rest of the lineup is going to be OG. That's so cool. And so, yeah, like, I mean, this is going to be the first, like, I think, official Zachary Ross and Divine tour, right? Or no? Yeah, for sure. First tour. Yeah, yeah we played some shows, but this will be our first tour. First time on the road. Um, I'm feeling great. Like, I I, uh, I feel great, uh, especially if you compare to all the, like, dark times that we've talked about. Um, I feel my outlook now is that, like, I'm really grateful for, like, like, take what you told me about you know you said if i write a song then it's going to sound like a zach song um yeah i'm taking i'm putting my faith in that and then the fact that people like zach songs and and you know in my mind my mindset right now is kind of like hey man overboard didn't fail some of the guys in man overboard had other things they wanted to do and that's fine that's a different thing people like this is me talking to myself people like your music as long as you just don't stop, yeah, you're gonna be fine. Just don't stop. 
and you stopped before, but you didn't choose to stop. It's okay. That wasn't your fault. Um, now you're not going to stop. And even if you have to start from a lower level and rebuild again, that's okay because we have the confidence of having done this before and knowing and the knowledge of just knowing I'm not going to stop. There's no one that can pull. This plug is cemented into the wall with the divine. It cannot be removed. Like, yeah, it's not. It was yeah, man overboard was a beautiful thing, but there's also something beautiful in the sense that now I can put out the type of music that people want me to put out without needing anybody, anything. I have a label and I have a band behind me and I have all the vehicles and I have my agent. I'm man overboard's agent. Um, I can do it now. Yeah. And like if I could say anything to like man overboard fans, it would be like, man, I feel you on wanting us to come back. Um, but I just want you to know that I want nothing more than to be playing music for you my whole life. Yeah. And this is how I intend to accomplish that. And if you, I'm, I think, and I hope, and I'm fairly confident that if you really enjoyed man overboard and give the divine the same kind of chance, you're going to see that like the party's still going. We just moved it over here. I love, dude, I love that because I, I think it's so important, like, to never stop no matter what. Like, and, and and it's so just nice to, just knowing that you're still writing songs is is a comfort. Just keep writing because your guys' bands and your band specifically, everything, struck a chord with people and they just need to be reminded of how much those songs meant to them and how much just even your voice and the way that you convey them any of your emotions means because it's like, I think you did go a few years where like bright green wasn't putting out a ton of music after man overboard. So there were, and obviously the pandemic hit and then, and then you see Zachary Ross and the divine come out and you're like, fuck. Yeah. Like this is great. Like you're, you're, you're listening to this new music and you're like, damn, this is still giving me exactly the same emotional feeling that I want to get. I appreciate that so much. Absolutely, dude. And then it's, it's cool. Cause then it's like a double edged sword too. Cause then you also like, go back and revisit all those old man overboard records too and everything. And it's, it's really special. So would you say that you're feeling like more inspired than ever to keep, you know, writing a new record or, or something like that? Yeah. As inspired as ever. Um, the, the, yeah. More inspired than I was with bright green. The difference between bright green and the divine is really simple. When I did bright green, I was still going like this waiting for man overboard. Sure. The Divine is a completely different mindset. Bright Green was supposed to, in my mind, was my side band to fill up some time. Sure. The Divine's my main band in my yeah. mind. Yeah. Man Overboard, the Divine kind of made it, to, which this is good for like me and my mental health, but the Divine kind of made it for me where Man Overboard isn't my main band in my brain. It's my old band. Yeah. Which is kind of where I needed to be. Yeah. Because whether that's what I want or some of our fans want, it's what's got to be. It, it's if I want to, I want to support the people I love in their lives. That, and that's okay. And I'm totally capable and willing to go out and do the damn thing on my own. I just needed to realize that's what was happening. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. You know, I, I just, you know, I just have like probably just like another question or so and just, just thank you again. But, you know, like I can imagine like, there, there's gonna be more man overboard. Like something, there naturally this will happen. Like I, and maybe that's just me saying that, but I'm you're, sure. You're, I think you're right. It will happen. Like you know, and and I think, I think in a sense, you know, maybe it's it could be. You never know. Like in the future, this could be something where, like, maybe that time away did elevate man overboard even more because I feel like the demand is is really there right now for Man Overboard to come out, especially seeing a lot of this, like... I do, too. I, I felt like it's been there for a while, but yeah. It's been there, you know? And then, you know, and, like, this is not to talk shit on, like, the new kind of pop... And I don't really consider Man Overboard really, like, a pop-punk band either. I think that was a... That's a lazy term, I think, that was that was thrown on you guys, Transit. I think Balance was called a pop-punk band. Balance wanted to be, like, like Jawbox. Exactly. Yeah. But it's like some people were like, oh, new pop punk. I was like, shut the fuck up. Like, um, but like with that, you know, like there is like that new crop of like younger kids like getting into pop punk and they're like maybe TikTok artists that are 
like kind of going the more MGK route and everything like that, which is, you know, it's cool in a sense, like, you know, some of it's cool, but you know, it, it does seem like there, there isn't a better time to sort of defend pop punk again, like to a degree. It's like you said, we're boys. So everything there's, there's a really, it's hard to believe that something organically won't happen. Yeah. Ever again, but it's gonna have to be really organically. Like uh, then the other, to add on to the like if I could say one more quick like a candid thing to sure. man of war fans would be like I tried. They're not. I don't even mean to say evil way. I tried to get man of war to do stuff for the last few years. I got to do this now, or we're gonna get nothing. Yeah. Um. So uh, it, it's it's gonna be an organic thing. I tried the unorganic. I tried forcing them. I'm not gonna force them or friend. So, but um, when something I think that organically something will will come up. Um. And, um, but, but, but at the same time, I almost, I can't lie to you. I, I crave a man overboard reunion less right now than I did a year and a half ago because of the divine. And I want to, you know, part of me would be disappointed if I worked really, really hard on the divine. And then we went and did something with man overboard right now. And then everybody just, all my work with the divine would just, cause you know, no one would care about the divine if man overboard did something right now. So I like to hope that maybe if there's a uh, rise or a peak in Man Overboard's popularity again, that me plugging away in this off time in my own band would have something to do with elevating Man Overboard in the future or just at least keeping it alive. Like uh, Tim from Rancid was in Operation Ivy. I don't know if a lot of people would listen to Operation Ivy without Rancid. I at my at my most ambitious, I want to be like Billy Idol, and I want Man Overboard to be Generation X. Yeah, yeah. Like that, I want to that. Yeah, how many people know he was in a band? Like a lot of people from that generation, but like uh, there's younger people just think of Billy Idol as Billy Idol. Sure. I would like to transcend it. I'm not gonna lie. Like, yeah. I, would, I would like to transcend it. So I, I hope that if we, um, I want to. I I like to think that I'm doing the work in keeping us keeping yeah i just you know the keeping man overboard something that people remember by me not going anywhere absolutely i mean i i don't think anybody is it has forgotten like to be honest i think you know i even think as time goes on and i think it's i think you're so right like hitting zachary ross and the vine as hard as possible is the most important because yeah like maybe if like, you announce tomorrow man overboard's back everyone's gonna lose their minds and then you're like shit what I about three time? months from now though it's, yeah, you know, it's it's crazy, but it's like, you know, I feel like the longer it goes on, though, it, it real it, it nobody is going to go anywhere. You guys laid the foundation in the sense where you wrote these important records that nobody's just going to forget. Like, you know, like it's 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 no different than like real talk is in the same conversation as full collapse or or tell all your friends, in my opinion, in my opinion, like and so, you know nobody is going to forget about those records. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's going to forget about any of your records. So I think, you know, if anything, it's just going to, it's just going to build the hype even more. And I think it's going to be kind of an insane thing. And I, I, I've joked about this with some of my friends in the industry where, you know, we're, we know some of the people that like run sound and fury and everything like that. We're like, how fucking cool would it be if in like two years sound and fury, which has never been bigger before, like it's huge. Last year was 7,000 people came and it's like, what if they could get fucking Man Overboard to play there? They get fucking Title Fight. They get fucking, you know, Tiger's Jaw. All these bands that were so fucking. We would love to. I mean, that's something that a special thing like that. I wouldn't be surprised if everybody in my band wanted to get up and participate. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, that would that would rule. It was like that. That's what it was like. You know what I mean? It was. I remember one time, put things in perspective, where there was a tour that was Man Overboard, H2O, and a really awesome band that some listeners may not have heard of from Pennsylvania called Wisdom and Chains. Yes. Mainly good, like, uh, rock and roll style, hardcore. Um, and I remember Man Overboard played our set one night, and I was taking my stuff into the van or whatever, and one of the guys in Wisdom and Chains came up to me and he said, um, if you if you put headphones on and watched your guy's set, I would have thought that I was watching Madball. 
I and, love that. And he was, and I was like, yeah. Like I remember laughing because, like, uh, yeah, kids were like really violent and like walking all over each other and jumping off stuff when we were playing. And um, and it was the, it was the same thing when Title Fight played. So we fit in with Sound and Fury back then. Yeah, you know, kids acted the same. No, absolutely. And that was just like a side thing I just wanted to throw in there. But like, dude, like it, it's I, I just, you know, I, I don't want to take up any more of your time. But, you know, it's just it's so amazing just what you've what you've done and the fact that you're still putting out music that is that is of such a high caliber and is and is still so important. It's just amazing, like just to see you really having that fire and that spark again. And And I think people will just naturally be gravitating towards that, you know, and that's so important, you know. I hope so. Yeah, that means a lot to me. I appreciate it. It's like I said, it's like I told you in the beginning, I remember fighting for uh, people who worked at Alternative <laughs> Press's attention. So it's, it's it's pretty incredible to hear somebody at your position speak like that about my music, but it means the world to me. It's awesome. It's all I do, man. It's a, I am a, I'm a music teacher. It's like my normal job and I am in a band. It's yeah. All, it's not, I don't, it's, I'm never going to stop, <laughs> you know? It's so funny that you say that, like about about like wanting somebody from AP to like this, because I I had a moment of this last year, and I I think I've read an interview of you that you were a big Comeback Kid fan. Oh yeah, and Andrew from Comeback Kid, he um, said something almost exact verbatim as you, and he was like, "Dude, like you work with all these cool bands, like why do you care about my little band?" And I was like, "Why the fuck would I not care about your band, dude?" Like what? <laughs> Like, to me, you guys are the most, you guys are, to me, I think one of the most, like, the eras of music that you guys came from and the the music you're still making, and I don't want to push it to the past or anything like that, but it's like, it, this truly was a, this caused so much amazing change in the music industry and was such a moment. Like, to me, like, I would be more, uh, awestruck running into you or like John Simmons for balance and composure than I would be running into like Anthony Kiedis for Red Hot Chili Peppers. You know what I'm saying? Like, or Billie Eilish, you know what I'm saying? Like, like that's crazy to me. And in a way I understand though too, cause I have my own versions of that. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's such an important thing that you guys, that you guys created and, and that you're still creating. And I, I just hope that your project with Zachary Ross and the Divine inspires more people to continue to write songs from that kind of place and, and sort of, you know, just, just make real records, you know? And I think that's just so important. You know, I appreciate that. I hope so too. I I really do. There's there's a lot of, a lot of the divine is me creating what I want to see, what I want to hear. Yeah. You know, so. Dude, well, it's amazing. Well, Zach, this has been great, dude. I just, I thank you for all your time and, yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it so much. I'm happy to come back whenever. And uh, yeah, go listen to the Divine. Hell yeah, dude. Enjoy your enjoy your day. Thank you, man. You do the same. I'll talk to you soon. See you, man. There you have it. Another episode in the books. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends, family, and enemies. Additionally, feel free to leave us a review wherever you listen to this podcast. It goes a long way and it helps us keep the show rolling. You can follow us on Instagram at Emolition Derby to stay up to date on upcoming episodes, Q&As, exclusive content, and more. Thanks again, and we will see you next time.